Hello, I'm Sean Stumbaugh, Battalion Chief with Consumers Fire. Welcome to the introduction to the Command Training Program. This is Module 1.1, Residential Structure Fires. So why are we doing this? What's the purpose? So the ultimate purpose is to improve operations through standard communications, standard risk management, and safe, consistent procedures. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is communications, risk management, and procedures. It's also to formalize our cultural way of operating and officially pass on our art of firefighting. I was able to give a abbreviated version of this to our academy a couple weeks ago. I went in and taught some Firefighter 1 lessons for them, but then I incorporated what Firefighter 1 curriculum was trying to teach them and then how we apply those things. So we talked about this particular. So the idea is that your first day on the job, when you're a fire intern with us, you learn how we do these things. It's part of our culture and we pass it on moving forward. So we should have a method for consistent instruction, which means the message that is being taught is consistent across all shifts. Um, that's the goal. And so that's hopefully where we're headed. And a consistent application of the instant command system when we're out there in the field doing our thing. And the biggest purpose is this right here, these, these five items here, the, what we call the NIOSH 5. And if you read NIOSH line of duty death reports, over and over and over again in those reports, these five things come up. So when we go into our wildland refreshers, we always talk about the common denominators on tragic wildland fires. Same thing happens on structure fires. These five things pop their heads up over and over again. And I like to put the word inadequate in front of them because somewhere in this process we've we fell down, we didn't do something right. So inadequate risk assessment. What is risk assessment? Evaluating risk versus benefit for the task that needs to be accomplished. Okay. And what is what is another phrase that we will that all firefighters would be familiar with that would be synonymous with risk assessment? Size up. Yeah, size up. Okay, so we're going to talk about size up as a verb and size up as a noun. But we failed to, to size it up. We failed to adequately assess the risk. Inadequate incident command. Somebody didn't get in charge, confirm that they were in charge, and communicate the plan. So that means people were freelancing and operating without um, a cohesive plan. We want to avoid that. Inadequate accountability. You know, there was a fire um, in Baltimore last year where the last engine company was leaving. There was a fire in a row house. Last engine company was leaving and there was a safety officer's vehicle out in the street. Like, hey, what's, you know, what's safety officer Bill's truck doing here? I don't know. Let's go check it out. He's not there. Well, where is he? I don't know. They went back inside the building and they found him. He was dead. And he had showed up at the fire and gone into the building and did some work in there and fell through the floor and was in a, the next, you know, the space below and ended up dying there. So they didn't, they didn't know he was there. They didn't know he was on scene, you know. So he was not accounted for. So inadequate accountability, we want to try to avoid those situations. How about communications? Do we talk about how things went in a fire afterwards and does communication come up as a challenge, something that didn't go well? Okay, I don't think we'll ever completely get rid of communications issues, but we can make them better. We can lessen their effect by practicing good communication practices. And then our standard procedures, you know, compared to a lot of places, ours are fairly solid. We have a lot of standard procedures and we have county standard procedures that, um, you know, even though we don't typically apply them 100% the same way, department to department, 
just the fact that we have things written down that says this is how all of us see the world, we're light, hair, light years ahead of a lot of other places in the, in the country, in the state even. So, But if you don't have those standard procedures, then things can go um, wrong because of that. So that's one of the things that comes up over and over and over again in tragic fires. So that's the ultimate reason there. We want to limit our participation in those five things. So what do you lean on to do your risk assessment or your risk management. We have a risk philosophy. It's not that different from others in the fire service. Most, most anybody that has a risk philosophy or a risk management statement will say something similar to this. So we respond to incidents on the assumption that lives and property can be saved. So we head for our our units and we jump in, turned out, ready to go, and we maintain our training, etc., on the assumption that when we get there, we can do something. So when we arrive, we need to manage the risk that's there and make decisions based on this model right here. So it says that we'll risk our lives in a highly cal calculated manner to save a life. So when it comes to rescue, when we raised our right hand and we swore to, to do the duties of a firefighter, we knew that we were assuming some level of risk at some point in our career to save a life. Um, we have to do that in a highly calculated manner. We do that in an educated manner. We don't, you know, we're not on a kamikaze mission. We're not on a suicide mission. We're not on a, you know a one-way ride. It's a round-trip ticket. So we have to make good decisions so that we get that round-trip ticket. But if we can save a life in a highly calculated manner, we might hang it out there a little bit more than we would on a normal day. The next part is we'll risk our lives a little to protect savable property. So can you think of any property that is worth risking your life for? I can't. However, is it risky to enter a building that's on fire? Okay, inherently, that's, that's a risky practice. So just to go in to a building that's unoccupied to put out a fire is risky. So we can't eliminate all of that risk. And, and when there's nobody in a building, it's just property. So it is our job to protect property too. However, we accept a much smaller level of risk when we go in to protect property. So we have to do things up front and outside and we make the building behave and we get the building to a, a state where it's safe to go in and save property. But it is still risky just to, just to do it. And then last, we'll not risk our lives at all to save what's already lost. So the property that's already lost, it's already lost. The lives that are already lost, it's already lost. We're not gonna go in and just because we get to them and pull them out, you know, we're not gonna miraculously bring them back if, if they are not salvageable. So we, at times, will have to make those decisions where, you know, there's people in there, but it's too late for those people in there, so we can't risk we're going to have to do something else. We're talking now we're in body recovery mode, that type of thing. So when it comes to the things that are already lost, there's nothing to be saved. We can't risk for that. That's, it's just not a smart thing to do. Okay, so this is what you lean on when you make decisions. You know, you're looking at life versus property. How much risk can I accept? How much risk should I accept? How much risk should I ask my subordinates or my companies to do? We have to ask these questions. Questions or comments on that? Everybody seen that before and we know it's there? Okay, that's a good, good thing. So here's a structure fire, and today what we're talking about is residential structure fires. We're talking about house fires, okay? Module 2.1, we're gonna talk about multifamily dwelling fires, a little bit more complex buildings. This is just your run-of-the-mill house fire, okay? This is the high-risk, low-frequency event, though. 
We don't do this every day. We don't get a structure fire every day. We don't get a house fire every day. There are some places in this country where eh, it's fairly routine for them to get a house fire or two even. Okay, so um, it just doesn't happen for us that much. But we are, we are good at it. We show up and we put these things out. Don't, do we not? We don't have a real long list of incidents in our organization that were close calls or serious injuries or line of duty death from that type of stuff. So I'm going to say that we have a fairly good safety record when it comes to doing this too. So I'm not saying that you know, we have to have this training so that we can do this because right now we really can't do this. That's not what this is about. We do this very well. But we can always improve and we want to make sure that everybody has an understanding of the right decisions to make and the way to communicate those decisions so that we, we never have that long list of things that have gone wrong. We can't buy this kind of experience for you. Okay, we can do simulations. We can light our tower on fire out here. We can do fire control three classes where we are actually gonna burn down a house. But those are so controlled, they're such controlled events that we can't simulate the adrenaline rush and the fear factor that you get when you hop off fire engine and there's a, a house fire. So we can't duplicate that in you. We can try to simulate it and get you, you know, to lean on the standard procedures and the risk management philosophy and all that stuff, but how you react to your own emotions and physical fitness levels and those types of things, how you react in these situations, that's up to you. So because it's a high risk, but it's a low frequency event, all we can really do is train for it. And then when it happens, we hope that we do it well. When we do have these, we should do <laughs> post-incident analysis. We should talk about it when we're done. Um, PIAs should be done as often as you practically can when you have incidents. Um, it should be done prior to leaving the scene if possible. You should try to get everybody together and chat about how things went. Um, you reinforce lessons learned. It's like CQI for the, for the fire ground. Paramedics are familiar with the CQI process, so it's kind of like that, where we talk about, hey, things that went real well, things that, hey, could have gone a little better. It should be constructive criticism. It should be able to go up and down the chain of command without personal attack. So you should be able to say, hey, chief, I have a question. What about this? How come, how come that? Um, and so if, if there's something that happens from the command point of view, we need to learn that stuff too. So, you know, it should, it should be a two-way information flow. Um, I, I do this, but I'm not 100% consistent on it, but I should be. This should be done every fire. We need to do this for the CSD fire too, because that was a, we don't get third alarm fires. And we should all, as an as a organization, know what went well <laughs> and know what could have been improved upon. So hopefully we're going to do that at the chief officer level and put out a report and talk about that particular incident because we don't go third alarms around here very often. So there's plenty to learn, I'm sure. All right, so here's our general communication plan. When we get a call, this is typically what's going to happen. This is, these are the things that we're going to communicate. You get a call, you head out to your rig, you turn out, hop in, you switch over to the tactical channel that's assigned, and there's a roll call. That's a county SOG, and pretty much everybody in the county is doing it this way, right? Whether you're going to City of Sacramento, Metro, or they're coming here, the expectation is pretty much the same wherever we go. There could be some things that happen in route, but when, um, when you arrive, typically the next communication will be what we call a size up or an initial arrival report. Is there a difference between those two? Yes. Okay, there can be, can be. Um, size up is, is what? Continuous process. 
Okay, a continuous process. So we talked about it a little bit ago that, that this is your risk assessment, right? So when were you first aware of suburban propane, Steve? Oh, I think when I was a little kid driving by it. Okay, so as a little kid, you knew that there was a place over there with big, huge tanks and it said suburban propane on it. And when you were old enough to read, you could read that suburban propane, okay. So now as a, as a uh, member of the fire department here, if you get dispatched to an unknown type fire at suburban propane, when does your size up begin? Well, I've had this before. It goes way back to when I first saw it. Okay. So your brain is going to start processing things really quick. You know, it's a computer up there. So it's going to go all the way back to your knowledge of suburban propane and start clicking off everything you know or think you know or whatever about that. And then it's gonna catch up to the information you've heard on the dispatch and gonna catch up to the information that you're getting out of your computer, et cetera. So it could even go all the way back to the point where you decided that you wanted to be a firefighter. Okay, and then you will ask yourself, why did I wanna be a firefighter? As you're headed for an unknown type fire at suburban propane. Okay, so that is, size up the noun, okay? That's the thing of a size up. It's risk assessment. It's processing information. What we say is, Jen, give me a size up for this picture. And then I throw a picture up there and you give me your verbal size up over the radio. That's the initial arrival report, okay? So we're gonna practice some initial arrival reports using IO CAN when we do simulations. IO CAN stands for Identify Object, Condition, Action, Need, and that's in our county SOG. And that's what everybody in the county should be training on, is we should be following IO CAN. Something else that we want, to, we want to talk about and communicate is what are our strategic priorities. We're gonna, we're gonna evaluate a situation, do our risk assessment, give our initial arrival report, and Possibly in that initial arrival report or shortly after, we're going to verbalize our strategic objective. We're going to pick a strategy and tell everybody what it is. There's a glossary of terms. How many of you access email through Outlook? Do, do you use the department Outlook system? Okay. In the Outlook system, there are folders in the public folder section that have our SOPs and SOGs. If you go to the county SOG folder, there is a glossary of terms you can look at. It's not a complete document, okay? It needs some work, but it's there. Um, if you access that kind of stuff through Target Solutions, it should be there also. But basically, a glossary of terms is the language that you use, where you have common definitions. So um, if you say something on the radio, it should mean the same thing that the next person would use that same word or that same phrase. Uh, can reports, conditions, action, needs, these are, this is how we update. If you train your brain to think conditions, actions, and needs before you key the mic, then you're going to give conditions, actions, needs when you talk. What's LPAR? What does it sound like? NASCAR. <laughs> Sounds like NASCAR? Okay. Or laces? Let's say it together, LPAR. Ready, one, two, three, LPAR. What's it sound like? Like a par, like a par right? Okay, it's a par. It's a par, it's a par, it's a par, it's a par. I'm not, I'm not, le par. I'm not saying that we're gonna change the nomenclature. I'm just throwing it up there because I want you to think about a couple other things is when you're giving a par, an update of who you are and how you're doing, okay? If you think about throwing location in there, that can be helpful for proactive accountability. What do the two A's stand for? Okay, air for sure. Air is an A. In a PAR, it's personnel accountability report. So one of the A's is accountability, but the second A is air. So we, we're, we're trying to be air aware as, as individuals and as companies. So when we're given an update, a PAR, we want to give our location, if you think about it, and give your air 
too, okay? What's a read back? Repeating back what was told to you. Okay, absolutely. You get a message from the sender, you're the receiver, you repeat back an abbreviated um, version of what was said so that the sender knows you heard, and what else does it accomplish? Say it again. You understood what was to be done. Okay, good. So the sender and receiver are now on the same page. And who else is on the call? A bunch of people, right? So you're driving in your fire engine. You're trying to figure out where the hydrant is and where to turn, where to make your next left turn. And then you hear something on the radio, rah, 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 rah. I was like, what did he say? Well, if there's a good read back, then you have a second opportunity to hear that information. So there's some good reasons to, to do the readbacks. And then report assignment achieved or report assignment complete. When you've been given an objective, you get it done, you report out that it's done. Or if you do something proactive, and the example that I'm using is utilities. A lot of times I'll get to my checklist and I'll be like, oh man, I forgot utilities. And so I'll throw out there, hey truck, this is command, give me uh, secure utilities. And then somewhere on the incident, someone will come out and say, oh, hey, this is, this is me, and I already got utilities. Utilities are secure. You know, and sometimes it's truck, sometimes it's medic, sometimes it's an engine. And that's great. That's good information. Thank you. But if, if you do it in a proactive manner, like working fire, are we going to secure utilities? Sure. We want to secure utilities, working fire. Okay, so I'm walking by the utilities, got my tool. Hey, look, I can do this. Shut the gas off, open the panel up. You look at where the uh, circuit breakers are, see if there's any trip. If there are, you try to memorize that. If there's a main shut off, do you shut that one off? Yeah, if there's a main, shut the main off. If there's not a main, shut them all off. Try to remember if any were tripped for the investigator later. Um, but then you just report that out. Hey, command, this is Medic 76. I got the utilities. Utilities are secure. Hey, thanks, Medic 76. Now I don't have to think about that. So I'll, I'll read back to you that utilities are secure. That gives everybody on the fire ground two opportunities to hear that transmission. Okay, so whether you were given the assignment or you're doing something that is proactive but should be done, okay, now if, if you go out and you say, uh, Command, this is Medic 76. I've just finished breaking all the windows in the house. Is that always the best thing to do? No. What are we, what are we thinking there? Like, flow path and all that kind of fun stuff, okay? All right, so within reason. All right, so that's our basic communications plan. IO CAN, a standard method of initial arrival report. Different in size up in that size up is the big picture process. And now this is what you want to say to people on the radio when you arrive. It is typically given by the first arriving company. And when we have a simultaneous arrival of companies, who should do it? Captain, captain of? The engine. the engine captain, right? So engine and truck are showing up together. The engine captain wants to make that call. Engine and medic showing up together or very close to each other. The medic should try to give the engine captain the opportunity to do it. Okay, so engine and medic leave the house together. Medic's going to be a little bit faster, maybe, a little bit different vehicle. Okay, so you're arriving on scene. You know your engine captain's right behind you. Give them the shot. Um, B-Shift had a fire not too long ago. Kevin Leveroni, Medic 76, left the station. Engine was not in the house. Engine's on the call, but he doesn't know where the engine's coming from, right? Gets to the fire, gives the initial arrival report. Perfect. <coughs> You're not coming from the same spot. You don't know where the engine's coming from. Give it up. So if you heard from me the last time we did this or right now that medic units do not give arrival reports, that is not what I said. What I said was simultaneous arrival, we try to give the engine officer the opportunity to make the first call because they're the ones probably going to take the nozzle inside and put the fire out. Okay? So what if we know how to identify the object and its condition, but we don't know what our actions and needs are just yet? We don't have enough intel to make that call. Okay? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, we're going to introduce something to you that a tool that's going to help you and everybody else <coughs> manage that situation when it pops up. Okay, so in order to come up with actions and needs, we need to go with a list of fire ground priorities. And the number one is, are we dealing with a life situation, a rescue mode, or are we dealing with a property fire, property mode fire? Okay, those two are completely different. And how we approach those two are going to be completely different. So we need to get that question asked early and get it answered early. So when we arrive, if we give the identify object condition and then we hold on our actions and needs, when we get out of that fire engine, we need to find out whose house is this? Where are they? You know, and, and is there anybody else in there? If we get an indication that there's a rescue, then we're going to be in the rescue mode. If we see the family with their three kids, their dog and their canary, okay, and hi, I'm with the fire department. Is this your house? Yes, this is our house. And we're old school, so Jen Rubin taught us how to do this. You know, and we're all here. Is anyone inside? No, no one's inside. Okay, we, we now have a property fire. Okay, so we need to get that question answered early, asked and answered early. Then we have strategies. There's four bullets up here. Used to be three. Okay, so the, the typical strategies are offensive, defensive, and combination. Are we all fairly comfortable with what an offensive strategy is, what that means? We're going inside, we're going to put the fire out. What about defensive? Surround okay, surround and drown. If we're arriving at a house fire and our strategy decision is defensive, when have we arrived? There's windows broken out, fire blowing out of the windows. Okay, and, and so what has happened prior to our arrival? Flashover. We've arrived post flashover, okay? So that's a good trigger point. If you've arrived and the thing hasn't flashed over yet, you have an offensive opportunity. But if you've arrived and it's already flashed over, you're gonna start defensive and then you might change it up once you get things knocked down. You're going to have to go in and overhaul it, right? So think of that. Did I arrive pre-flashover or did I arrive post-flashover? Now, what about combination? What is a combination strategy? It's using offensive and defensive. Say that you're going to go in, but you're also having to protect okay. other areas at the same time. Right. So you, you're doing a defensive attack, but there might be some offensive things you have to do. Now, are the, is that a situation that shouts, watch out? Okay. Um, defensive, especially on big buildings, we think big water, master streams, et cetera. We don't want people operating in and around areas where master streams are penetrating the building, right? So here's the example that I use. The Westmark room and the Pierce room are a large commercial facility, okay? The Westmark room is on fire. It's vented through the roof. It's burning. Everything's burning. That's a de defensive fire over there. Okay, so we set up our sticks and we're flowing water. And at some point in this attack, the incident commander sees the Pierce room is not involved. Wow, there's a firewall. I've been in this building before. That's right. There's a firewall. See that curtain back there? That's a firewall. That's right, it's, it's a separate space. Oh, you know what? They've got all that high pile storage in there, multi-millions of dollars worth of stock. We should probably try to protect some of that. So let's see if, if we can do a, a combination strategy here. We're going to stay defensive on the Westmark room, but we're going to come inside the Pierce room. We're going to go to the firewall. We're going to open up that warehouse door, and we're going to hold the fire to that side. So we have a defensive fire out there with master streams and all that kind of stuff going on. And then we're going to put people into an offensive position to save some property. Okay. Is that risky? 
Okay, there's some inherent risk. You have to do, you know, risk versus gain. You have to do risk assessment. You're not going to pull up to that fire and on your initial arrival report say, you know, I'm on scene, I've got a large warehouse and uh, it's separated by a firewall. The area that's involved in fire is going to be a defensive attack and then we're going to go combination into the uninvolved part and uh, protect the property in there. It's not going to happen on initial arrival, okay? So a combination strategy will be something that will be determined later in the attack. Like, huh, light bulbs, ding, let's do that. But that gives us time to talk incident commander to division supervisors, all the red hats on the same page, so we don't hurt somebody doing it. So if, if those are our three normal strategies, what's this transitional thing doing up there? Okay, we're going to transition from one to the next. Now, typically, it's going to be the desire with a transitional strategy is going to be, I want to go offensive on this thing, but I'm going to have to start from a defensive position. Okay, I might, this is what we say, hit it hard from the yard, okay? We want to cool the space before we go in. Now, what would be some indications where that might be handy? A good example is like a rocking garage fire. If you come pulling up and all you see is just fire in the whole front of the house, you don't really know what's going on. You just want to knock that down. Okay. Then, do your, then you say it's knocking down to the size of the seat that got involved in the second part of the house where the firewall's held. So you might pull two and a half just to get water application on it. And it's okay, cool, it's still in the garage with an inch and three quarters and advance into the actual garage that you put it down. Okay. So there are, there are examples where, you know, you, you want to do that. So like this picture up here shows the Zircon Crest fire. We have a working garage fire. It's vented through the roof. We need to figure out, is it in the box or is it out of the box? You know, has it transitioned into the attic or into the space of the home? Think also flow path. Right, so flow path, I don't think is something new. I think firefighters have known this for a long time. You know, it's, it's hot over here and heat rises and the, the heat wants to go somewhere. So there's gonna be a flow path. Um, and when we talk about confining the fire in Recio, to me that is flow path. But the NIST studies and modern science has given us a new way to look at it, and now we've given it a name, flow path. And if the flow path is in your way, it's in your, the way of the direction you want to go to attack this fire, what you might have to do first is control the flow path. And so you're going to transition from this exterior attack, and then when you make it behave, you're going to go inside and, and finish the job. So I like to say it's initiating an offensive fire attack from a defensive position. So that might be in the front. It might be in the back. It might be, you know, somewhere. It, it's the place of your choosing where you're going to start. But it's, it's a strategy that we need to talk about and we need to be able to verbalize it and everyone needs to understand what it means. Because what, once we make this decision, life or property, and then offensive, defensive, transitional, we want to say that on the air. We want to call the play and pass it out there. Um, and then we want to confirm the communications. Typically, this is done by the responding BC. Once you've made your decision and thrown it out on the air, the BC will repeat it back, and then everyone knows what we're doing. Okay, so your initial action communication. We've talked about size up. It includes the dispatch information. You got the call. You know where you're going. You quickly analyze your personal knowledge of that address. Or if you're dispatched to a house, but you've never heard the address before or anything like that, are the houses in Elk Grove and Galt fairly similar? I mean, we know what houses look like in this town, right? Especially in the newer parts. They all look the same, right? So then visual cues on the way. <laughs> See a big column of smoke, big glow in the sky at night, something like that. And then how do we get that three-sided view? 
Okay, we're going to drive past the address so we can see the three sides on the, on the way in. And what else does that accomplish for us? Gives us room for the truck, right? So if they're coming in that, that correct direction, then it gives them room or they might have to jockey, jockey around us. So then we give our IO can. We identify our ob object, conditions, actions, and needs. Now, if you know what the object is and you can articulate what its condition is, what if you're not quite ready for actions and needs yet because you need some more information? Okay, this is the new little tool we're going to give you. So we're going to initiate a tactical pause, meaning I need to go take a look. What I don't need is the rest of you showing up on scene and doing something that I'm not ready for. Okay, <coughs> so we're going to slow you down just a little bit. And we're going to do that by saying, unit standby. So engine 76 arrived, single story house. I've got some smoke. Unit stand by, I'm taking a lap. Okay, so what does that mean? What do the other units do? Sure. Okay, tactical pause. Unit stand by is synonymous with level one stage. Okay, so you could say, engine 76 arrived, single story house, I got smoke. Don't know where it's coming from yet. I'm going to take a lap. Units level one stage. Or you could say the exact same thing and say unit standby. Something to initiate the tactical pause. So in a tactical pause, do we pull over wherever we are, side of the road and stop? No. We keep coming. So first engine's on scene. The first truck's going to come to the address because we gave them a big space, right? Second engine is going to look for a hydrant. You're going to look for the best hydrant. Is the best hydrant always the closest hydrant? No. Route of travel might indicate what the best hydrant is, okay? So second engine can find the best hydrant. They can stand by there if they want. If they got a big column of smoke and this is a working fire, they can, they can lay the line. They can figure out how they're going to supply the attack engine, okay? All other units, though, should stage and wait. They keep coming, they get close, and they get where they're in a really good spot to either come in or get out. So you don't have to stack the street. We can get close to it, and then we can wait for the rest of the play. Medic units. What should medic units do? Well, medic units should do what medic units do. Okay, we've got something. We don't know what it is yet. So we're going to park out of the way. We're going to grab all our stuff. We're going to go over to the attack engine. And if the firefighter on the attack engine pulled the line and they're charging lines, pull the line. Get ready. What um, assignment should you anticipate? Two out. Should anticipate two out. If we determine that we're <laughs> offensive rescue mode, what should you anticipate? With Helping with search and rescue. Helping with fire attack. Okay. All right, so our strategic priorities. We're going to be offensive, defensive. Combination, like I said, is going to be determined later on in an incident. It's not going to be something we're going to just right off the bat recognize, oh, this is going to be a combination strategy. However, transitional strategy can be recognized early. Once you get out, you get that lap, you can say, man, I really want to go over here but I can't do it yet, okay? I gotta get this heat out of here first. That's a transitional strategy. Um, life or property, life or property. So we wanna say our, our strategy, we wanna say our mode of operation on the air, and that's the commander's intent. So those words will represent the commander's intent. First engine arrives, who's the instant commander? First engine captain. Okay, that captain. But we do not burden that captain with establishing and confirming command. Why don't we do that? They're going to go task-oriented very, very shortly. We want them to go task-oriented. As soon as they focus in on tasks, opening doors, pulling hose, looking for people, they, they can't look at the big picture. But they get to determine what the commander's intent is because now... They're going to go do the task, and we have to support them as we arrive. Okay, so that represent those words represent what the commander's intent is. We should be able to take that 
and write an IAP from it. Okay. We could give goals and objectives based on what, which of these um, strategies and modes of operations we have chosen. So here's an example. Battalion 10, engine 74 arrived, two-story house with black smoke showing from the Charlie side. Engine 74 is taking a lap. Second engine, take command. Establish a water supply, medic you two out. Other units, stand by. Okay, think IO can. How much have I given? Okay, do we know what the object is? It's a two-story house. What's its condition? Black smoke, Charlie side. What are our actions? Taking a lap. What are our needs? Command and water supply. Medic, you got two out. Everybody else stand by. Okay, now I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna figure out what I got. In this instance, why can't I just make a decision? I can't I can't see where the smoke's coming from. It's in the back of the house. Yeah, it could be a barbecue, a shed, I don't know, garbage can. Okay, so I need more in info, need more intel. Am I rescue mode, property mode? Is the house on fire, yes or no? Okay. All right, so in the tactical pause, we are going to give you some space and respect, but it won't last forever. What are we expecting? Information now. An update, right? Information. So... You'll give us an update with a CAN report. What are the conditions you found? What are your actions, same or different? And what are your needs? Okay. If you haven't already said the strategic mode, now you will tell us what the strategic mode is, or you'll repeat it if you liked your original decision. How do we declare, or why do we declare, the alpha side? Okay. Is it always obvious at a house fire? Is it usually obvious at a house fire? Okay, usually it's obvious at a house fire, but not always. Now, how about a multifamily dwelling, a garden apartment? Is it going to be obvious there? A commercial building? Not always, right? So if we practice declaring at the obvious, it will be muscle memory to do it at the unobvious that makes sense. So how does a captain declare the alpha side? Could be where he's coming in. Okay. Stating the you know, alpha side is where the rig, our rig's parked. Okay. Where the hose line is. Engine 7-1's parked on the alpha side. <coughs> or if you didn't do it during your uh, arrival report, you've gone out, now you've given us an update, the tactical pause is over, now we're going to go engage. I'm entering the alpha side, par of two, Air is full. My objective is fire attack. So then we all pull up and we go, where's that alpha side again? Oh, right there where the fire line is going inside the door. Okay. Now, what about if you decide that you're going in on the Charlie side? So now you're going to give me an entry location with a par from the Charlie side. Engine 71, we're entering the Charlie side. Par of two, air is full. We're doing fire attack. Where's the alpha side? On the, on the opposite side, right? So engine 71's line goes to the backyard. We can see it. If we walk around there, oh, they went in right there. Okay, well, that's alpha over there, right? So you can declare the alpha side by declaring the Charlie side. But what we really want to, want to start practicing is that entry report, and that's active accountability. Okay, it's active accountability, proactive accountability. So the incident commander can track that. You're going into the ideal H. Tell us you're going in. How many of, the, of you are there? Etc. cetera. A B2 and S2. C Meadow Way. That's up there, ways. C Meadow. All right, so CAN reports. CAN reports are a standard short report on conditions. Keeps information <coughs> flowing with concentrated transmissions. Okay, so you could argue 
that we're going to be talking too much on the radio if we're talking this fire out. Okay, you can make that argument. I can make the opposite argument saying if you and I are well trained to, before we key our mics, have a um, flow of what we want to say, then we can follow a pattern and say what we want to say or what we need to say in a much shorter period of time. And then if you give me the three things that I want, because now I want your conditions, your actions, and your needs. If you give me those things, I don't have to call back and ask for one that you didn't give me. So if you just gave me your conditions, but you don't tell me what you're doing or what your needs are, I'm going to say, well, okay, um, are you getting water on the fire and do you need anything? Then I'm taking up more time. So this will take training, but we can do this with practice. <coughs> Um, we can also, from time to time, reinforce the strategic mode, or, and we can finish our transmissions with a PAR. Active accountability. So when we first rolled this out, I said, every time you talk, I want a PAR at the end. How are we doing with that? Better. Are we doing it very often? Probably not. It depends on which operation. Like if we're doing Rick stuff, we're pretty good at it. We right, know, hey, right. This is Rick operations. But on this initial stuff, everyone's so amped up about trying to get to work. Right. They, they just forget to do it. Right. And, you know, some people have said, come on, that's, that's stupid. Okay, sure, it's stupid. But the reason that I'm asking you to do it often is to maintain proactive accountability. So let's, let's compromise on this, okay? Here's the compromise. Entry report, give it to me. Tell me you're going in. How many are you? Air, Okay. some benchmarks within the incident. What are some of the benchmarks within the incident? Important information. Knockdown. Knockdown of the fire. Good one. What's another? Yeah, the rescue. Victim found. Victim found. Absolutely. Firefighter missing. Okay. A mayday. Primary death. Primary complete. All right. Okay. So um, that, now let's talk about your crew. What are some of your crew benchmarks? What are some of the Im important benchmarks along the way of your work activity. Accountability. Okay, that's because that's what I want to know. You went in with three, do you still have three? Air. Who has, air. The, who has the lowest air? Right, your, your company's air is the lowest company member's air. Okay, so if, if, if I go in with you, just ask me, hey, Sean, what's your air? Because I'll be the lowest, all right? But so a, what would be a good benchmark to report give uh, the chief a can and finish it with with your air report half, half right that's a good benchmark because that tells the incident commander okay they're in there they're okay the same number of people they're all accounted for they got half air they don't need to come scream screaming running out ah, i'm at half air i'm out you know they can they can work for a little while but what do i need to do Start yeah i got to move my next chess piece right i got to get my next piece in line so when you do come out I could already have them going in, or you guys can cross at the threshold. So, so benchmarks, those important things. You're going to give a can. You've got, you're, you're telling me that, you know, you've got a primary complete on the, on the first floor. Now we're heading up to the second floor to do a primary search there. I've got par of three, air's half. Whoa, took you half your air to search the first floor. There's going to be more heat and smoke on the second floor. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reinforce you right now. I'm gonna get somebody heading your direction, okay? So active accountability, and you know we don't get into these long drawn out operations that are house fires. We put them out pretty quick. But if we practice this stuff at the easy ones, when we get the harder ones, it'll be better um, communication and it'll be second nature for us. Okay, again, we kinda, um, have covered this already. PAR is the acceptable terminology, but location is a good idea. How do you maintain your knowledge of your location when there's a smoky environment? Are you on a hose line? On a hose line? Yes. Which way you came in, right or left? Okay. Which way did you turn, right? What nomenclature what words should we be using as far as orientation okay came in we went left all right went left we went left and we got to a corner 
and we turned right. Okay, now we're going over here. Okay, now I'm in another corner. What corner am I in? Yeah, right? Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta orientation to the building. So, <laughs> Chief, we went in, we went left, we hit the Alpha Bravo corner, we took a right, we're heading for Charlie. Haven't found anything yet. Parv 2, airs 3 quarters. Boom, I know where you are. I know that there's two of you. I know your air supply is good. I'm not too worried about you yet. Okay, so think, think location. Try to maintain your crew's orientation to the building and be able to communicate it to us. So here's an example CAN report. Units responding on Alpha 6, engine 74 is on the Charlie side. I have a child trapped in the bedroom upstairs. Engine 74 is going to make a rescue. I need a 24-foot ladder to the back. Okay. <laughs> this is the update from engine 74 who arrived with smoke on the Charlie side. They now have a fourth side view. How did they get it? Okay. And when we say lap or 360, do you have to walk all the way around the building? No, what you need to do is get to that Charlie whatever corner, Bravo or Delta, and get a look around, right? So now I took a look. Oh, man, there's a kid hanging out right there. So saying that on the radio, I'm a little amped up, okay? But have I declared a strategy and a mode of operation? What is it? Okay, offensive, rescue operation, I'm going to do the rescue. I need a ladder. Conditions, actions, needs. Okay. So, who, who's going to hear this right here? Okay, maybe the truck. Who else? The, the medic. Who else? Your nozzle firefighter. Who else? Your engineer. Who else? Command. Okay. So, hey, I, I threw out my needs. I'm not going to try to figure out who do I want to assign to bring me a ladder? Ah, bring me a ladder, okay? Somebody's gonna bring you a ladder. And if it doesn't show up pretty quick, let's, and this is where a readback happens, okay? Hey, Battalion 10's on scene. Engine 74, I copy. Battalion 10's on scene, I've got command. You're on the Charlie side, you have a rescue. We're gonna send you a ladder. And then I'm looking like, who heard that? Who can give me a ladder? Truck 74 command, go ahead. Ladder to the back, we got a rescue in the back. Roger that, taking ladders to the back. So the truck didn't have to repeat more than that. They said, I got it. We're taking ladders. Boom, we're good. Okay? So it, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, on scene, single story, wood frame, residential structure with type 5 construction and a concrete tile roof. If you're very well trained and practiced in that, go for it. But say single story house. We all got it, right? Single story house, we know what that means. So use clear text, good words that we can all understand. All right, when do we give these CAN reports? Hey, when something significant happens or I need something. We give the entry report when we go inside the immediately dangerous to life and health atmosphere. According to OSHA, what is required when you enter an IDLH on your, on your person? Self-contained breathing apparatus, okay? So that's, that's what it means. Um, so whether it's an attic fire and you can see all the way through, right, that's still the ideal H when we step into that house because that's risky. So that's when you give the entry report. Um, give a CAN report and from time to time give me your location and your air. Hey, a convenient and proactive time where it seems appropriate to do so. You get something done, report task complete, give it out to me, you know, and, and if you just talked to me 30 seconds ago and told me you're at half air, and then you want to tell me something else and you don't tell me that you're at half air, that's fine, because I already know you're at half air, all right? But if you haven't talked to me in a while, give me all that information, send it out there. Rick, we talked a little bit about that. There's a whole process for Rick communications. It's not part of this class, but you guys should be well trained on that. So, and usually when there's going to be a RIC that's going to require multiple companies, there's going to be a chief 
a RIT group supervisor there managing your communications and your air. Okay, readbacks. We talked about this. Um, is copy a readback? Okay. Is copy appropriate sometimes? Sure. Okay. If it's not one of those critical benchmarks, it's not a strategy or a tactical objective communication. You know, it's uh, command engine 71. I put, I put cones across the street. All right, copy that. You know. <laughs> um, command engine 71, we've got the victim out in the front. Command copies, engine 71, you have the victim out in front. Medical group, command, medical group. Engine 71 is out front on the alpha side. They're on the lawn with the victim. Respond to the alpha side and assist 71. Medical group copies, go to the alpha side, assist 71 with the victim. Okay, if it's important, we need to hear it. If it's minor, hey, copy's fine. Readback comes from aviation. Any pilots in here? Pilots, pilots, pilots. Okay, no pilots. All right, if I say... Watsonville traffic system 9510 hotel on the 45 for left downwind 19 full stop landing Watsonville. Do you have any idea what I just said? No. You're out over Moss, Moss <laughs> I am. I am over Moss Landing. Absolutely. You said you weren't, you said you weren't a pilot. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Aviation has a specific language that they speak, and aviators understand the language. <laughs> and they do readbacks, especially when you're doing instrument flying. If you get a clearance delivery from an air, air traffic controller, you have to repeat verbatim what they say or you don't get a clearance delivery because they'll give you information like the runway that you're going to take off from, the altitude you're going to climb to, the heading you're going to fly, and then what navigation aid you're going to use to fly through the, the uh, invisibleness, you know, the clouds. And if you don't get that just right, you're going to veer off course, you're going to crash into another airplane, you're going to hit a mountain. So that's why they do readbacks word for word. We don't have to do them word for word. We can abbreviate them, but we want to repeat the essential information. So this takes practice too, okay? So here's an example of one. Command engine 76, we're on the second floor with light smoke, searching, par of three, air three quarter. Engine 76, command copies. You're on the second floor, light smoke, you're searching, par three, air three quarter. So could I have just stopped right there at command copies? I could have, okay, but this information isn't just for me and Engine 76. This information is for the RIC group, okay? Where's Engine 76? Mayday, 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 Engine 76, I lost my firefighter. Where were they? Remember they said they were on the second floor. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's why it's important. And now, we can take a break.